Welcome back to another edition of Inside the Humidor. I'm Josh Eagle alongside Ed Brandyberry and Josh Mills. We're here inside the Smokestack Cigar Lounge. You can see around us in Moon Township, Pennsylvania. We're located at 7305 University Boulevard. We're here to answer any of your questions. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to this edition of Inside the Humidor. I'm Josh Eagle along with Ed Brandyberry and Josh Mills. So today we're going to talk about what makes a boutique company and a lot of different people don't necessarily agree on how many cigars, is it quantity, is it quality, is it somebody else making your cigars for you, are you under a certain threshold of sales per year. Ed, let's start by talking boutique cigars in the realm of maybe a company that people haven't heard of but they still make huge volume that may be considered boutique. I think a lot of people would consider Kristoff a boutique cigar company. Uh, Kristoff actually doesn't make their own cigars. They're made at uh, the PDR plant in the Dominican Republic but they're considered a boutique by most people. Uh, on the other hand, there would be debate about some people, for instance, a company like um, uh, Tatuaje uh, still doesn't turn out the kind of numbers that uh, Perdomo, Oliva, Rocky Patel turns out, but they're made by My Father's Cigars, and My Father's Cigars is a good-sized company in its own right. However, they're online some people have argued might be considered boutique because of simply the small offering they have in comparison to what they do. So number but, of offerings is definitely something. How many cigars they produce every year, how yeah, many facings of cigars that they have which would be considered boutique. But I most boutique cigars are, because of the nature, are going to be made by large factories. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have... at least someone else. At least somebody else. Yeah. You, you know, once you go to, from the boutique status to a manufacturing status of, say, Altadis, the Romeo and Juliet, and having their own plants, or, you know... Fuente. Well, well like, it's hard to... I mean, because I, I think we'd all agree that Black Label Trading Company is boutique, and they just bought their own factory. Mm -hmm. The right. Lazona factory, which is Espinosa's. Which is Espinosa. Uh, Oscar. So there's exceptions to the rules. I mean, guys... Oscar Valerius. Yeah. Yeah, he's got his own factory, right, making right. one, one or two lines of cigars. Right. So, but I don't think that that different. I don't think you have to have your own factory to be considered boutique. Somebody else can make your cigars, and you can be a boutique brand because mm -hmm. you only have five or six facings. Mm -hmm. um, take somebody like Caldwell, for example. I'm smoking a Caldwell right now. Caldwell's a cigar that no one's really heard of. They make great cigars, but it's made by Ventura who makes other small batch of cigars, but doesn't like really Rod have its own huge line of cigars. No, like Rodrigo. Like Rodrigo. Right. So that's interesting to me is the factories don't have, some factories are huge factories like Placentia, who's making 1502, which also makes a huge amount of, of the cigars you'll see in a, in a cigar shop. But do they even have their own line? Yes, they do. But interestingly enough, I believe that their cigars are marketed by General. There you go. That's about as far as boutique as they can. Which come. is about as far as boutique as you can get. So the Placentia factory is making these b boutique cigars for these smaller companies, but doesn't have its own huge line of its own. And it's one of the largest manufacturers of cigars in, in the world. I don't know. They definitely are one of the largest growers. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. Uh, most people say they are the largest grower of tobacco in Central and South America. And it'd be interesting to see the numbers if you put that all together on right. how many cigars they're actually making compared to General or all of these mm -hmm. in their, their factories. Yeah, because you, you the figure... The only company I could find numbers on was um, E.P. Carrillo, which is what Ed is smoking, and they made 1.58 
million cigars last year. 1.58 million. That was their entire production for the company. Well, let's take that into consideration. Let's, let's put that against Ed's favorite line in the Perdomo small batch yeah. release. How many cigars were in their limited release? <laughs> and that was a limited release. It was like 1.02 million. Or yeah, something like so that, almost so. the entire, in their limited release, one time a year release, small batch. One of the runs and that's was small almost batch equal, for them. right? Was almost equal to the entire production from EP Carrillo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it's tough to find numbers on these companies because mm -hmm. these companies are all make their home base outside of the United States and without FDA regulation. And they're private. And they're private. And they're they don't have required. to disclose disclose their numbers. Exactly. They don't have to disclose any sales information. So basically, we have to go on in the word boutique and sales is more opinion of the cigar store owner, bloggers, and just how many boxes people buy and sell. And in the cigar world, sometimes the discounts that people can offer, you know, you can tell the bigger from the smaller. Yeah. Yes, you can. But name recognition is going to be one. And like we talked about in, the, in prior episodes, the magazines, the magazine advertising, you know, you're not going to find a black label ad in aficionado. But you may find a black label ad in Cigar and Spirits. Yes, you might. Yeah. You might find a, you're not going to find a Caldwell ad in Aficionado, I but don't you might think find so. it in another small publication mm -hmm. or online retailer. Mm -hmm. And some of the online retailers have really given steam to the boutique industry yeah. by focusing only on boutiques. And um, talk a little bit about your site. Yeah, we got uh, stackcigars.com. Focus of that is boutique cigars, um, limited release cigars, that kind of stuff. But it kind of goes back to the, the shop's opinion because we've got Tatuaje on there. We've got my father on there. Um, my father is one that I'm hesitant to call a boutique. I know a lot of people yeah, consider am, it, but I, I mean, I they make too. Ashton cigars for them. Some of the Ashtons they make, um, you know, they're making cigars for a lot of people. They're a big operation, good sized factory. They grow their own tobacco. And yet, um, I understand that most of their production is actually tied up with the La Cristobal Roma de Cuba and with San Cristobal, yeah. which are yeah. brands owned by Ashton, who, interestingly enough, doesn't make a single stick. No, when he makes the Ashtons, and uh, my father's cigars makes the other cigars for him, which it shows you the variety in our industry right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Associate, who can, there's only so much there's land. There's something like 60 to 80 factories just in Esteli. Absolutely. And there's only so much land to go around and so many crops. It has to be owned by somebody. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you don't have control or lease of some of the land in Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic and you want to make a cigar, you can't go to your backyard, guys, and start planting some tobacco and roll cigars. Mm -hmm. So Unless you don't want to do it. Unless you have yeah. a lot of... A lot of money for three years, right? And you're planting for three years, old. Because most guys, I don't. I think most reputable people aren't using tobacco that's younger two three. than three, yeah. three years, two three, three years. years. No, absolutely. I mean, and most is going longer and aging longer than that. But in the boutiques, I definitely, you can definitely taste the young. It's like it's like bourbon, small yeah. batch bourbon, where you can you can taste. How young the bourbon is. It tastes is. a little green, maybe. It tastes a little green. And sometimes with the boutique cigar, real boutique, you're going to get maybe a little more ammonia than you'd get on something that was standard production, making millions of them a year. Because the companies that can make millions a year, they have the financial backing and the, the storage facilities to, to make sure that they can maintain tobacco for three to ten years. Right. In a, and in a, not, in a not do it. In and a, not sell it not do it in a back room in the corner mm -hmm. of a house. Mm -hmm. Well, the tricky part is when you got someone else making your cigars for you, you just don't have as much control. Definitely no, don't. Absolutely, you have con some control over the tasting notes. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to get the blend the thing, but mm -hmm. when it comes to actually rolling it, it's not your operation. If this blender's doing a crap job, you don't, you're not the one that gets to go fire them or fix them. And no, and, and even Rocky Patel has teamed up uh, with other rollers and other companies. And Rocky Patel, you would think, would have all of his own uh, tobacco and crops, it's a big brand, but they're still being rolled, manufactured by multiple yeah, right, manufacturers. Yeah, right, right. Ashton's the other one. Share. I don't think any of us would call it Ashton a boutique company no. in a million years, but <laughs> they don't make a single cigar. They don't have a factory. Hey, let's be serious. Ashton, I understand, just began as the house cigar for Holtz. Right. 
right? Right. And there you Look go. Look at them now. Yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, today, yesterday's boutiques were probably people like Oliva, Perdomo, Rocky Patel, Lafleur. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, those yep. guys were the boutiques. We're considered the boutiques for sure. Yeah. And it'd take take one of our buddies, Jim Robinson, and the Oscar Valerius factory. Uh, mm -hmm. He made one cigar. They make the leaf by Oscar. And I think it last I last heard it was in 150 shops or yeah, it's uh, all the way from uh, right New here. England. Of, yeah, New England, and I've seen people with them. And that started as Carolina a house cigar, Ohio. Leaf and Bean in the Strip. Where did John Demharder goes? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Leaf and Bean in the Strip is where that was the house cigar. That's right. So in the Strip District of Pittsburgh, he makes a cigar, blends it with a guy who actually used to work for Rocky Patel as a tour guide, also was a distributor of Rocky Patel cigars in Honduras. They team up, they make a cigar, and now it's in 150 retailers uh, in the Northeast. And it's a boutique. And it's a boutique cigar. Yeah, I mean, no one would dispute that. I don't think that, you know, Jim would say he's turning out millions of cigars a year. No, absolutely not. And that's a boutique in the, in the prime sense of the word, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, my opinion for boutique, there isn't a clear-cut credential. No, that's kind of the hairy part about it. For me. Yeah. I think that a boutique has to be defined by the weight of its advertising campaign, has to be defined also on the amount of sticks they make per year. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you have less sticks, sticks... per year is a good measure, but... But we, take Ashton, for example, yeah. which, which probably gets beat by my father... In production. In production, but in status... <laughs> You know, Absolutely. in status, I would, I would assume. I know people who claim name. that the Ashton name is that big. that La Roma and San Cristobal production exceeds production for my father's entire line. So, so that that again, we so know of shortages we've had in my father's cigars that we don't get. Right, they have to produce that first because the name driven. You know, Christoph, the name has become pretty popular. Uh, about five years ago, that was a tougher cigar to find. They had a little niche going on there. But with that popularity, you come... Sam Adams. Mm -hmm. Is that a craft he's beer He's still company? considered a boutique beer Exactly. Be he's one of the larger boutique mm -hmm. beer companies. I don't think companies. of him as a craft beer company anymore. He actually That's got the definition. Is. He actually got the definition changed. Uh, they actually got the definition changed because of that, to be able to produce more barrels because of Sam Adams. To Right. He's as much a craft beer company to me as Blue Moon's a craft beer. I mean, I'm not... Right. Which is owned by what? Miller Coors. Coors, or, yeah. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in the my mind, I guess. I, I feel you, no, know, because in the batik realm, we're dealing with the same thing. Um, well, what about quality bloggers? now? The, I was reviewing, you know, for the show, and I was reading a few guys. One of the fellows made what I consider to be a pretty far-out statement. I can agree, Josh and I talked about this earlier, I can agree that a lot of aficionados will seek out boutiques, but he went further to claim that they're probably also the best cigars being made. And I, I find that just not to be the case. I mean, How can a boutique company that doesn't own its own operations, doesn't grow its own tobacco, um, doesn't have its own rollers, produce a better cigar than someone like the Oliva family or the Padron family who has control over every step of the, or the Perdomos, the step, control over every step of the operation and they have control of the entire operation. That just doesn't make any sense to me. No, I, I agree, it doesn't. But, they're, but on the other hand, they do make, because they're a small company, just like the small beer companies make some really good beers. But I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw this out at you then, just to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, guys. Um, Black Label, Oscar Valeritas, they do have their own rolling, yep. and they are yeah. capable of producing this. You just, both, you guys just threw out generalizations. You, you just talked about Blue Moon, okay? Yeah. But they have the largest Miller Coors, Budweiser. They have the best facilities. Yeah. They have the most accurate people. The best brewers in the world yeah. is Budweiser, the best beer. You know what I mean? Most would say yeah. no. Most <laughs> would say no. But all of those are probably the best, the most experienced, and the oldest. You can say the same for Perdomo. Mm -hmm. You can say the same for Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. They're the best, the most experienced, and the oldest, but that doesn't make it the best. 
It could be the most consistent. You could put every any words you want. So I see where the blogger is going. Is it a blog? I didn't. It yeah, was like a blogger. Kind of a small batch idea when you're producing smaller quantities, more attention to detail, that kind of thing. I, I, you, I think you just made, made not, your own I'm point. Sure I wouldn't say it's a blanket statement. Yeah, yeah. Because I've had, you know, if a guy's brewing beer in his house and he's definitely, it, it could still taste like crap, you know. Yeah. But there's a lot of great craft brew companies that are sure. making the best beer in the world. And when they go and rate these beers, Budweiser's not number one. Mm -hmm. No. It still sells the most beer, mm -hmm. but it's not number one. It's not the best beer. Which could be where the cigar thing kind of comes in with the boutique and where these bloggers really find a lot of love and satisfaction on something. Because what mm -hmm. I will say about the boutique cigars, you get a lot of different mm -hmm. blends. You get a lot of variety. You get variety. You get the ability to maybe throw something out there like a steak beer, the brisket beer from Blue yep. Canoe. You have the ability to throw something at your customer base that... Seven Romeo and Juliet can't cigar. do. All what? of a sudden, Romeo and Juliet and Monte Cristo can't say, I'm going to make a jalapeno infused cigar. They can't do that. No. You know, their customer base They're is not. They're even coming out with a cigar in conjunction with, with from what I understand. I don't know if this aging room is done in conjunction with aging room or if the aging room just has that name. No, the last I read. No, it's done with aging room. That's no, the last I, I read. It, yeah, Romeo and Juliet gave the control to. To Oliveros. His mind, Oliveros, and he created yeah. the Romeo... Rafael Nodel. Yeah, but the Romeo and Juliet by Aging Room, which is going to be a really interesting collaboration in the first of that cross-genre from non... Yeah. Second Mozart. largest cigar company in the world. Partnering, going, with. partnering with one of the smaller mm -hmm. cigar companies. The last two years... You know, you've had some number ones. Uh, this year we had Olivo, a little bit larger brand, but mm -hmm. they started in that same way and built up steam. Um, three Two years groups. ago you had my father with the Florida de Las Antilles hitting the number mm -hmm. one cigar and aficionado. Two years ago you had Aging Room and the Alec Concerto. Alec Bradley before Florida de Las Antilles. Alec Bradley, another one who doesn't make his own cigars. Right. You know, but they had a Races number one. Cubanus and then Alec Bradley's another one where... When did they make the crossover? I mean, you, you don't consider Alec Bradley a boutique, do you? Or would you? Con uh, no. I don't now, but probably I'm influenced. I don't know what his production Maybe is. Maybe as recent as five I'm years ago. I'm probably more influenced by his having, here's another factor, his own sales force. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whether he's boutique or not in production, the appearance that he presents in public is not boutique. Well, Caldwell's got his own sales force. Right. One, so it's two another, guys. He, <laughs> they cover the entire country. <laughs> they still got it. <laughs> they still have a sales force. Well, that, I mean, there you go, though. Yeah. What are the definitions? I think the definition isn't actually clear cut. No, hmm. it certainly isn't. No, it's not. It's probably got to come down somewhere of, around number of blends and total production. Total production has got to have yeah, to be where yeah. your boutique line gets cut off. I still think that advertising for a million dollars has a lot to do with if you're boutique or not. You know, let's take a company like uh, Bodega, for example. Yeah. The guys who are backing Bodega have an awful lot of money. Right. But they have two blends of cigars and, and a few sizes of each cigar. Even though they have a lot of money, and you've seen their advertising in some mm -hmm. places where you wouldn't think you would find their advertising. That's correct. It would still be considered still boutique. boutique because oh, yeah, of the amount of production. Boutique. And no one's ever heard of the name. So, like... Not hearing about it, too, has to play a factor if it's not something that it's on the ears that everyone would recognize, like recognizability. You know, yep. It's not like Michael Jordan, you know I mean? Everyone knows who that is. Yeah, that certainly plays a part. But there's always... Um, and, and it depends on... The Villager the, of the world, maybe. Villager you know, you know, maybe doesn't have the most name recognition, but I don't think that they would be considered a boutique. They're a 125-year-old company. Yeah, they one of the oldest cigar companies, companies Are they the boutique? Yeah, I have a boutique? hard time figuring that one out because they're so huge in Europe, especially in their machined product. But if we con confine them just to premium, they might be on the bubble. Yeah. Because I don't know what their production's like for, for uh, a premium cigar. And that's what makes the debate tough, Kraft. Right, right. Um, boutique versus large manufacturing of cigars. Is that what you're even going to call it? Large manufacturing? What, what do you call that? I don't we know. We have boutique and then not, not, not boutique. No name, not boutique. 
Well, they call the the fellow. Let's get to some of the quality and the history with some of these cigars. Um, you know, uh, I'm smoking a cigar by the guy who they like to advertise the Godfather of boutique cigars. Right. Ernesto Perez Carrillo, who developed the La Gloria Cubana line, and then later sold his company to General Cigar, and now has EPC Cigars, making last year's number two cigar. Absolutely. The Perez Carrillo La Historia, phenomenal cigar. So there you can't argue with a blogger, right? Right. Who says, here's someone who has his own tobacco, has his production himself, He's in charge of what's going on, and he's making great cigars. But I'd still say he's boutique because he has is very limited in his overall production. Well, Josh, talk a little but bit. But the quality's there. Right. Talk a little bit about that crossover, Josh. Where are these boutique come? And a lot of that, the example he just gave. Ten minutes. Give some more examples of that, where, where we're coming across, where somebody maybe sold their brand and now they're coming out with a boutique, which also muddies the water even more. Yeah, well, another big one that jumps to mind right away is La Silla, or mm -hmm. Sam Lesia, and his, uh, his, his tobacco line, very recently bought out by General Cigars, the largest cigar company in the world. We've got a boutique section right here where Lesia is still located, but, um, I mean, once you're a part of General, it's hard to think of him as a boutique anymore. They've been, you know, they've <laughs> yeah, really? sold out, but from what I understand, he's still in control like of his line. He's still making it at the same, right. the same quality and to the same standards. Um, so a lot of people look at it as a good thing for a company like that because now he's got more money to play with maybe. He's got more backing, more security. But uh, Other people think are sure anymore. that they've changed his Yeah, brand, some people think that they've changed and already. And ruined I already. I don't know. And I, I'm not convinced of that. No, I, I don't uh, think so either. But I mean, once you tie, that would be like saying that your favorite craft brew was now bought by Miller. Mm-hmm. The first time you have it after that, it's now a Miller. Well, everyone will say it sucks. Everyone says they changed I, I'm it. I'm sorry, but <laughs> you and I, I mean, we, we know enough about business. If you have something that works, mm -hmm. why would you change it? Absolutely. Yeah, why well, would you go up? Yeah, there's a reason why it got acquired. Yeah. Right. Crown Heads is another one. These guys developed the CAO line. Which right, they, sold were part, out in general. they worked for him. So now they make a, a cigar. That doesn't mean that... Craft doesn't necessarily mean that, or boutique doesn't necessarily mean that the people behind it are amateurs. Mm -hmm. No. You know, they can already have built up a company in the past, sold that company, and started over again with a new line, and they're considered boutique. And that happens in the beer world, too. Yeah. It happens an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Or you look at someone like Eric Espinoza and his company. Um, I don't think he's sold one before, but he's worked with. Yes, he has. Has he? He and Ortega were partners. Okay. And yeah. they had EO brands. Yeah, but he's worked with and Alec Bradley. He's worked with General and some of their lines. Right. And he's done a lot. He's not a newbie to the cigar world. Um, but his cigar would be considered boutique. Definitely a boutique. Mm -hmm. The Espinosa and this but is the The Lozona plant can't possibly put out the amount of cigars that a, a major company like Rocky, even though he doesn't make his own, he has facilities to turn out a lot of cigars. Same thing with Oliva, Perdomo, Altides, General. Padron, yeah. Fuente. Yeah. Well, I mean, Fuente, we can't, I keep forgetting. I mean, Fuente's uh, like number three. Right. It, uh, just a huge and everything that they yeah. do. Yeah. One thing I wanted to bring up is, for me, it's hard to talk about boutiques, and I think a little bit about limited releases. What do you guys think of, of limited releases and that movement and people coming out with these short runs and s small batches and... It's thousand box production. In the next, in the last three years, that's been a really new thing. A lot of limited productions, a lot of cigars that, that were a geographically exclusive, cigars that were membership exclusive, mm -hmm. cigars that are shop exclusive, cigars that are online exclusive. A lot of exclusivity to try to make cigars more interesting in pockets, and I think that's great for the retail end, and I think it's great for the consumer too. Sure. Because if you only have to concentrate on X amount of cigars, you can really, really do that well. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, the blend that you, this is where it comes in. The blend that you're making, if you know you're making a limited run, you don't have to be sure you have that tobacco 
year after year after year. Right. Yeah, if you want to age tobacco down. for 10, 12 years or whatever you want to do, you don't have to do it with thousands right. and thousands right. and thousands of bales. You have this many, it's, and it's yep. unlimited run. It's like Perdomo's small batch that he's doing, which we all know is it's small batch for him, but it's bigger than the entire production that, of some boutique companies. He theoretically wouldn't ever have to make that cigar again, mm -hmm. right? right? Knowing Nick, he's probably got the tobacco to do it again next year. But even if he doesn't, it'd be accepted in the industry. Right, you don't have right, to do that. Right, right. Uh, it's defined, it's there. It, and a date was the put on. The vintage question is the question that I often wonder about because you'll have guys say, this is a vintage cigar, and then you go, well, it's, you know, it's a four and five year age that's that's good that's yeah. better than the average probably not by much then. Yeah. but but not by a lot right right but i guess so the the, the debate though it, it's still there's a lot of muddy water in the debate what's a boutique and what is a non-boutique so are boutique cigars in your opinion josh are they better do you enjoy them more than a, than a non-boutique or is what, it I, what i like the most about boutique cigars and that whole movement is that they get to push the envelope and i think you see a lot of innovation Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly who started it, but I, I feel like the Mexican San Andreas wrapper was really pushed along by the boutique companies, which is one of our favorite wrappers. Um, and then some of the bigger companies maybe jumped on board with that movement. Um, I mean, you don't see too many cigars coming out of Oliva. Well, except for the unadvertised Padron. <laughs> the unadvertised Padron, yeah, that's yeah. kind of a... Which... Uh, so I think people it's been started, speculated yeah. that uh, Padron secretly uses Mexican San Andreas on his Maduros. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't have any no confirmation on that, I guess. But uh, there's well, a lot of reps out it's there. Nicaragua. A lot of these competitors claim it's true. There's a lot of smoke out there, though. Uh, Padron's a big boy, though. It might just be fun to slam him a little bit. I don't know, but yeah. They have but I think you're right. Finding some tobaccos that are a little bit different with something that the boutiques maybe yeah. have, have gotten a pinpoint on and have done a nice yeah, job. Peruvian tobacco being used in a lot of stuff. Colombian mm -hmm. tobacco. Mm -hmm. A bunch um, of new, in the fire cure. Yeah, fire cure. Well, look, when CAO was boutique before they sold out to General mm -hmm. and when Perdomo and other people were making their cigars for them, um, they were doing interesting things with Brazilian tobacco. There, the CAO Italia even uses some Italian tobacco in it. Not a lot, just enough to call it Italia. Right. But it, it uses uh, Italian tobacco. Who uses Italian tobacco to make cigars? It's a cigarette tobacco most of the time. Mm -hmm. No, that, but, that's the fun. Of it. But that was the fun. That, this, the things that even a big company like Drew Estate has mm -hmm. done, like Sam did, with uh, fire curing that we see these kinds of things going on. So uh, I guess we uh, we could talk a lot more about boutiques, but. Yeah, th it's, it's, a, it's a tricky subject. What's your favorite boutique though, guys? Let's start with Josh. And what's your favorite boutique company right now? I know that changes every day, you know? Yeah. You get a new uh, one in, but. I think one of my favorites right now, Crown Head certainly jumps to mind. And then uh, Caldwell's well, the guys who did CAO, CAO before yeah, yeah, just talking about it line. started the new line. Um, they do great stuff when they did their limited releases. When that Mason Dixon came out, that was a really, really great cigar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then Caldwell, his stuff is really good too. And uh, I'm interesting mm -hmm. to try some of that Lost and Found stuff that they're doing uh, in collaboration with some other companies. But yeah, I've been really enjoying theirs lately. No, and they have a, they have unique blends, and they put them right on the label of they're using 20% this and 50% right, that. Right. That's kind of neat. And, what would be your favorite boutique company out there right now? I guess I'd lean a little bit toward a little more traditional guys like 1502. Mm -hmm. I'm partial to Nicaraguan tobacco anyhow, but 1502. But yet among the Dominicans, I like George's line. I like the Rodrigo line. And I also really am taken with Crown Head's entire line. Yeah, they have, they have a nice line of cigars. And again, the... You know, the CA, these are guys yeah. that know what they're doing mm -hmm. who have jumped into a smaller amount of cigars and they're going to maximize their mm -hmm. profits and have more control. Plus, they've sold their company that's to the largest cigar manufacturer in the world, and that can't be a bad thing. No. You know, start you out with some better clearly. resources than when you started with nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I like a few of the... Uh, I, I, I definitely like boutique cigars. Um, one that we didn't talk about that might be on that edge would be Room 101. 
You know, even you though it's, it's made in the Davidoff Company, <laughs> I consider the fact the name Room 101 in that genre uh, I, I of unrecognizable where you're coming from. cigars, but knowing where they're made from and knowing who they're made by, you'd say they're not boutique cigars. But they've got the advertising. They've got a lot of lines. I don't know what the production is. To me, I consider them in the same tier as maybe Alec Bradley or something Which like that. Which could definitely but be. I but I don't know. And then in the smaller run stuff, you know, I'm really liking, I like the black label that we got. Mm -hmm. I like Eric Espinosa. I like this Laranja cigar that we have right here. Uh, it's We're a getting really the nice cigar. <laughs> uh, I like the Caldwell. But they just keep making stuff. But E.P. Carrillo, if I had to pick one, would probably be my favorite one right okay. now. I like yeah. the short run a lot. The La Historia, La Historia was, was one of my favorite cigars of the year. So E.P. Carrillo yeah. uh, would probably be my go-to. Yeah, E.P. Carrillo makes a good cigar. Yeah. But all these names and all this nonsense we just threw out there, the, the name of the game is to try stuff, Yep. to explore, to jump on these blogs. Nothing is set in stone. This is still all an opinion game. Right. And the, the fun part about it is following those boutiques until they become not boutiques, and then we can argue. Yeah, if you've been smoking Romeo and Julieta and Macanudo for the last 10 years, it might be time to come pick up a boutique. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, not be afraid to stop in a store and ask them, what, what might you have in the boutique line? Yeah, something a little different. Yeah, something to try out. Well, that was enough rambling on this edition of Inside the Humidor. For my co-hosts, Ed Brandy Berry and Josh Mills, I'm Josh Eagle. Get out there and burn one. Thanks for watching Inside the Humidor. Ed, any closing thoughts? Well, I think that uh, we'd like people to be reminded we have approximately 750 choices to make when you're shopping for a cigar here. We have everything from $4 sticks, actually bundled cigars for two and a half dollars, all the way up to $34 cigars. Boutique and non-boutique. That's right. We've got Padron, Perdomo, Rocky Patel, we've got Fuente. Then on the little side, you're going to find Crowned Heads, E.P. Carrillo, Tatuaje, Iluzoni. The list goes on and on and on. How can they get a hold of us, Josh? Uh, you can find us on Twitter at, uh, at Stack Cigars or at Smokestack PGH. Um, if you have any questions you'd like answered on the show, shoot us a tweet there. Also email us and, uh, or find us on Facebook. And also check out our website, stackcigars.com. All the cigars we talked about today are going to be on there, um, all the boutiques and stuff like that. So, Boutiques yeah. and hard to find. Right. But info at smokestackpgh.com. Yep. Yeah, or info at Stack Cigars. Or can yep. we get there? Yep. We can get there any way. There's numerous ways. Get a hold of us any way you possibly can. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Go out there and burn one.